Okay, hi. Um, today we're going to go through the stages of child language acquisition. So this is the start of the second area of study of Unit 1. Okay, thinking about how children learn language, I'd like you to just pause here and have a quick brainstorm. Have a think about, of all of the subsystems, or six subsystems, which one do you think is the first one that an infant masters? <clears throat> Once you've written something down, come back to the video um, and check if you're right. Okay, so these are the stages um, of child language acquisition. So we talk about four stages. We have babbling, one word utterances, two word utterances, and then the telegraphic stage. And I'm gonna take you through each one of these today. Okay, the first one is babbling. So this happens from um, around five to seven months of age until the child le starts learning to actually um, speak words themselves. So um, infants begin by gurgling and cooing and making those classic kind of baby sounds um, that we associate with little babies. Babbling is babies experimenting with different sounds. They're not restricted to the sounds of their mother tongue, which is really interesting. So we know from looking at the um, International Phonetic Alphabet and the IPA chart that there are um, sounds that exist in human language that we are not able to produce anymore because we speak English and those sounds don't exist in English. What's really interesting is that babies who grow up um, in English speaking families, for example, they will be able to make all of the sounds in the IPA chart from um, from the time when they begin babbling. Um, they so all babies, no matter no matter which um, country they grow up in, no matter um, what language or languages they're surrounded by, they all babble in the exact same way, which is really interesting too. They do this to figure out their vocal apparatus, meaning the the different parts of um, of their mouth and their speech organs, which create sound. Um, and they do this to discover the sounds that are distinctive for their mother tongue that they will end up learning. Eventually, so towards the end of the babbling stage, babies will change their intonation to match the mother tongue. So we know that there are different intonation patterns in English compared to Mandarin, compared to French, compared to Spanish and so on. Um, and those intonation patterns will start to be mim mimicked by the babies before the babies are able to say any words in their language. They're the first things that babies pick up on. Babbling is innate. Me innate means built in. So basically this means that um, children who can hear, deaf children um, and children who are born to deaf parents, they all babble. It's not something that we learn from people around us. We just do it automatically. Babies exposed to sign language from birth um, will also babble with their hands too, which is quite interesting. Okay, so I'd like you to pause here and go to the yellow book, page 47 to 48, and read and summarise into your notes um, the section titled Babies Cry in Mother's Tongue. Once you've done that, come back to the video. Okay, um, we're just going to watch this, which is an example of a baby babbling, just so you have an idea of what it sounds like. So we can hear that the baby is making noises, obviously, with their mouth, but none of those sounds um, are translating to any kind of meaning for us. They're just noises. Okay, the second stage is the one word utterance stage. And this starts happening from um, around 12 months of age, so around about a year old, um, up to 18 months of age. Okay, so this is a point in time where babies discover that sounds relate to meaning. So they hear the people around them speaking and they realise that the different sounds that people make, make things happen or they mean particular things. They learn words such as no, uh-oh, and imitate sounds made by things around them like cars and animals and that kind of thing. Typically, the words that they produce will be monosyllabic, meaning that they have one syllable, such as ma or da and will follow a consonant vowel construction. Um, that's mainly because they're easy to pronounce and they don't have a very strong grasp over their voc vocal apparatus at this stage. Typically, babies will learn concrete nouns first, such as cup, spoon, bicky, chair, anything that they can touch, see around them. Um, it's 
much easier obviously for them to process things that they can see um, and touch around them than concepts like happiness or whatever it might be. Okay, babies first learn words that contain the sounds most frequently used in their mother tongue. At this stage, their understanding of words said to them is much better than their ability to use the words themselves. That is to say that they can actually understand a lot more than they're able to say at this stage. All right, and here's an example of a child in the one word utterance stage. All done, little boy? Are you all done, little one? Are you done? Yeah. Yeah? Should we get you out? Okay. Okay, so we can hear, see in this example that obviously the child is only saying one word, yeah, but they are using it in the correct way. They clearly understand what the word means um, and they can't expand on what they're trying to say, but they can convey a message through the use of their voice. At this stage, babies have around 50 words in their vocabulary which isn't a lot. Um, so to overcome this limitation in their vocabulary, they overgeneralize, which means that they, um, they use the same word to refer to a lot of different things. <clears throat> and this allows them to make maximal use of their limited set of words. For example, a child might use the word moon to refer to all round things, such as the letter O or a cake, okay? Because they've only got the word moon, they see that it's the same shape, so they overgeneralize. Um, similarly, they might use the word fly to refer to specks of dirt or small insects because it kind of follows a similar pattern. So specks of dirt might look similar to a little black fly, small insects. Obviously, we can see the connection between those and flies as well. So you need to make sure that you've got overgeneralization in your notes too, please. Okay, the next stage is two word utterances. And this starts happening from around 18 months of age up to 24 months of age. At this stage, children begin to use their set of words to make new combinations, to say new things. So typical combinations might include things like dada, chair, mama gone, eat bicky, bye bye boat. Okay, they're not particularly sophisticated, um, but they are creative in the sense that the child probably hasn't learned those two words together. They're, they're starting to put um, rudimentary, the basics of sentences together, sentences together on their own. Um, so having a think about the words that we just looked at, what do you notice about them? I'll go back to them for a moment. Okay, so what I'm noticing about these words is that they are content words. They do not yet have enough grammar to, the, um, to be able to use function words or to really understand what their role is. They also don't use grammatical markers such as tense changes. So inflectional morphemes um, are kind of out. They, they don't understand how those work yet at this stage. Because of this, their utterances that they make, their two word utterances are quite open to interpretation. For example, if we look at the first one on that list, data chair, it might mean I am on data's chair or data is in the chair or put me in data's chair. Could be a whole lot of different things. So you really do, um, when you're speaking to a child up the two word utterance stage, you do need to use a bit of um, trial and error and a bit of guesswork, um, even though they are starting to put together more complex sentences. The combinations are not random. So when a child is describing the location of something, the location always follows the subject. So for example, mama bed means mum is in bed. When a child is describing an action, the action follows the subject. So for example, mama eat, which is exactly the same, interestingly enough, um, as what we do with our fully formed grammar. So we know that we always go subject verb. When a child is using imperatives, um, meaning remember imperative sentences command you to do something. So when they're using imperatives, the action comes first, just like they do for us. So kick ball. Children are not parroting phrases that they've heard. They're rearranging the words that they have in their set, in their vocabulary to create new phrases to convey information to the people around them. And this is pretty incredible because it actually shows us that children at the age of two have already grasped a lot of the um, really important grammatical structures like subject verb order, a subject verb object order that we have in English. Okay, so um, this is going to give you an example of um, some one word and some two word utterances. 
Daddy. Can you say Daddy? Daddy. Can you say All done? All done. Can you say Thank you? Can you say Amin? Amin. Can you say <laughs> Now say Raiden? <laughs> say Daddy? Daddy. Daddy. Say Grandma? Ma. Say Carson? A cookie. A cookie. What about this one? What about this one? Fish. Fish, yep. Put that one. What is it? Meow. Meow, yeah. What about that one? Blocks. Um, what about that one? Go. Blocks. Block. Block. What about that one? No cow. No cow. What about that one? Toys. And this one? Skis. Skis, yeah. What about that one? Rain. Rain, yeah. What about that one? Good. Yes. What about this one? Eye. Eye, yes. And what about this one? Ball. Hand me. What's this right here? What is that? A helicopter. Helicopter. Helicopter, you're right. And what is this right here? Windmill. A windmill. What is that on top of the farm? A cupola. A cupola. Very good. What's this right here? Silo. A silo. Good job. What's wrong? <laughs> you hurt your knee. Huh? Oh. Sorry. Sorry. Daddy, boy. Big tractor. Big tractor, yeah. Okay, so we can see um, particularly this child at the end is definitely in the two word utterances stage. So he's putting together words that he knows like hurt and knee to convey a new meaning. The last one is the telegraphic stage. So this happens from around two years um, to up to 30 months of age. This stage is called the telegraphic stage because it sounds like children are reading a telegram and we'll look at why that is later. They're very, very concise um, and they leave out many function words. So they're starting to put in function words now, but um, they're not using them in the same way that an adult would. For example, they might say back tonight rather than I will be getting back tonight or I will be coming back tonight. Their language is starting to be more grammatically correct, but there's still a lack of function words and morphemes, um, particularly inflectional morphemes. They begin using WH words at the beginning of, beginning of questions, like who, what, when, where, why, um, using the suffixes ing and es, and simple prepositions like in and on. Okay, so this is an example of a telegram. Um, so I'm just going to skip down to the bottom, and you'll hear how a lot of the function words have been left out. So... Success, four flights Thursday morning, all against 21 mile wind, started from level with engine power alone, average speed through air 31 miles, longest 57 seconds, inform press home Christmas. Okay, so um, you do kind of need to understand how telegrams work to be able to understand this, but you can see that there are pretty much only content words in that. And that's where we get the name from. So this is an example of a child in the telegraphic stage. And you can see how much more he is able to say than the child that we just saw in the two-word utterance stage. Hi, baby cricket. I hold in baby Bridget. When baby Bridget is big, I teach him how to go potty and take a bath and how do all the letters. Yeah, that'd be great. And be on the bed and drink water and pick up mommy. All right, so we can see that he is, he's got quite an extensive vocabulary and he is on his own, putting words together um, to express what he's trying to say. And it does make sense, even though it's not grammatically correct. Okay, I'd like you to watch this video that I'm gonna play for you now and just um, jot down maybe three interesting things from this um, TED talk. 
I want you to take a look at this baby. What you're drawn to are her eyes and the skin you love to touch. But today I'm going to talk to you about something you can't see. What's going on up in that little brain of hers? The modern tools of neuroscience are demonstrating to us that what's going on up there is nothing short of rocket science. And what we're learning is going to shed some light on what the romantic writers and poets described as the celestial openness of the child's mind. What we see here is a mother in India, and she's speaking Koro, which is a newly discovered language, and she's talking to her baby. What this mother and the 800 people who speak Koro in the world understand that it, to preserve this language, they need to speak it to the babies. And therein lies a critical puzzle. Why is it that you can't preserve a language by speaking to you and I, to the adults? Well, it's got to do with your brain. What we see here is that language has a critical period for learning. The way to read this slide is to look at your age on the horizontal axis. <laughs> You've done that. And you'll see on the vertical your skill at acquiring a second language. The babies and children are geniuses until they turn seven, and then there's a systematic decline. After puberty, we fall off the map. No scientists dispute this curve, but laboratories all over the world are trying to figure out why it works this way. Work in my lab is focused on the first critical period in development, and that is the period in which babies try to master which sounds are used in their language. We think by studying how the sounds are learned, we'll have a model for the rest of language, and perhaps for critical periods that may exist in childhood for social, emotional, and cognitive development. So we've been studying the babies using a technique that we're using all over the world in the sounds of all languages. The baby sits on a parent's lap, and we train them to turn their heads when a sound changes, like from ah to e. If they do so at the appropriate time, the black box lights up and a panda bear pounds a drum. A six-monther adores the task. What have we learned? Well, babies all over the world are what, are like, what I like to describe as citizens of the world. They can discriminate all the sounds of all languages, no matter what country we're testing and what language we're using. And that's remarkable because you and I can't do that. We're culture-bound listeners. We can discriminate the sounds of our own language, but not those of foreign languages. So the question arises, when do those citizens of the world turn into the language-bound listeners that we are? And the answer, before their first birthdays. What you see here is performance on that head turn task for babies tested in Tokyo and in the United States, here in Seattle, as they listen to raw and la, sounds important to English but not to Japanese. So at six to eight months, the babies are totally equivalent. Two months later, something incredible occurs. The babies in the United States are getting a lot better. Babies in Japan are getting a lot worse, but both of those groups of babies are preparing for exactly the language that they are going to learn. So the question is, what's happening during this critical two-month period? This is the critical period for sound development, but what's going on up there? So there are two things going on. The first is that the babies are listening intently to us, and they're taking statistics as they listen to us talk. They're taking statistics. So listen to two mothers speaking motheries, the universal language we use when we talk to kids, first in English and then in Japanese. Ah, oh, I love your big blue eyes. So pretty and nice. During the production of speech, when babies listen, what they're doing is taking statistics on the language that they hear. And those distributions grow. And what we've learned is that babies are sensitive to the statistics, and the statistics of Japanese and English are very, very different. English has a lot of R's and L's, the distribution shows. And the distribution of Japanese is totally different, where we see a group of intermediate sounds, which is uh, known as the Japanese R.
So uh, babies absorb the statistics of the language, and it changes their brains. It changes them from the citizens of the world to the uh, culture-bound listeners that we are. But we as adults are no longer absorbing those statistics. We're governed by the representations in memory that were formed early in development. So what we're seeing here is changing our models of what the critical period is about. We're arguing from a mathematical standpoint that the learning of language material may slow down when our distributions stabilize. It's raising lots of questions about bilingual people. Bilinguals must keep two sets of statistics in mind at once and flip between them, one after the other, depending on who they're speaking to. So we asked ourselves, can the babies take statistics on a brand new language? And we tested this by exposing American babies who'd never heard a second language to Mandarin for the first time during the critical period. We knew that when monolinguals were tested in Taipei and Seattle on the Mandarin sounds, they showed the same pattern. Six to eight months, they're totally equivalent. Two months later, something incredible happens. But the Taiwanese babies are getting better, not the American babies. What we did was expose American babies during this period to Mandarin. It was like having Mandarin relatives come and visit for a month and move into your house and talk to the babies for 12 sessions. Here's what it looked like in the laboratory. So what have we done to their little brains? <laughs> we, we had to run a control group to make sure that just coming into the laboratory didn't improve your Mandarin skills. So a group of babies came in and listened to English, and we can see from the graph that exposure to English didn't improve their Mandarin. But look what happened to the babies exposed to Mandarin for 12 sessions. They were as good as the babies in Taiwan who'd been listening for 10 and a half months. What it demonstrated is that babies take statistics on a new language. Whatever you put in front of them, they'll take statistics on. But we wondered what role the human being played in this um, learning exercise. So we ran another group of babies in which the kids were get the same dosage, the same 12 sessions, but over a television set. And another group of babies who had just audio exposure and looked at a teddy bear on the screen. What did we do to their brains? What you see here is the audio result, no learning whatsoever, and the video result no learning whatsoever. It takes a human being for babies to take their statistics. The social brain is controlling when the babies are taking their statistics. We want to get inside the brain and see this thing happening as babies are in front of televisions as opposed to in front of human beings. Thankfully, we have a new machine, <laughs> magnetoencephalography, that allows us to do this. It looks like a hair dryer from Mars, but it's completely safe, completely non-invasive, and silent. We're looking at millimeter accuracy with regard to spatial and millisecond accuracy. Uh, using 306 squids, these are superconducting quantum interference devices, to pick up the magnetic fields that change as we do our thinking. We're the first in the world to record babies in an MEG machine while they are learning. So this is little Emma. She's a six-monther. And she's listening to various languages in the earphones that are in her ears. You can see she can move around. We're tracking her head with little pellets in a cap. So she's free to move, completely unconstrained. It's a technical tour de force. What are we seeing? We're seeing the baby brain as the, ba as the baby hears a word in her language. The auditory areas light up, and then subsequently areas surrounding it that we think are related to coherence, getting the brain coordinated with its different areas, and causality, one brain area causing another to activate. We are embarking on a grand and golden age of knowledge about child's brain development. We're going to be able to see a child's brain as they experience an emotion, as they learn to speak and read, as they solve a math problem, as they have an idea. And we're going to be able to invent brain-based interventions for children who have difficulty learning. Just as the poets and writers described, we're going to be able to see, I think, that wondrous openness 
utter and complete openness of the mind of a child. In investigating the child's brain, we're going to uncover deep truths about what it means to be human. And in the process, we may be able to help keep our own minds open to learning for our entire lives. Thank you. Okay, so <clears throat> what I'd like you to do now is please go to Love the Lingo, so the yellow book, um, and go to page 67 and 68 and do tasks 3, 5, 6, and 7, please. Thanks.